Uh, for example, the kind of real ambivalence of older siblings towards younger one ones, alongside um, a clearly expressed need of this other as protection against ontological insecurity. And by that I mean um, experiencing oneself as present and continuous in the world, as not constantly and always fragmented, uh, but as present and continuous in the world and having a sense of security in one's own uh, being, uh, a being that's adequate enough to enable us to venture out into the social world, to be with others and face the risks of life. And, so, you know, the, one of the risks are the risks of being with others. Um, so all of this is kind of going on in sibling relationships. So they're, they're a wonderful kind of place to uh, start to think about identity and identities. And taking a psychosocial perspective, I'd also take the view that the structures and dynamics and processes of that internal private sphere um, also uh, significantly shape what we experience as the external world and that in some uh, ways that the internal world creates our external world. Uh, I'm kind of separating them here, but I, I don't really think that. I think that there's a constant kind of movement and porosity between those two worlds. But so that the internal and external, private and social, are not mutually exclusive, but are entirely constitutive of one another. So that fantasies, desires, thoughts and feelings not only build the internal world of the individual, but a made material and a given substance in the form of language, discourse, families and family policies, institutions and organisations such as hospitals, schools, culture, social systems such as the welfare state and social processes and structures such as class, gender and race, and places and spaces. All of those things, if we look hard enough, we can see all human psychic processes in the workings of all these supposedly external and real phenomena. So, I'm going to stop. I'm Wendy Holway. Um, I think we've already realised that the term identities covers this great huge span, which at the one end is very social and the, and the other is really very psychic, although I, like Helen, would say psychosocial. Um, and so to, it's, it's going to be quite difficult to say, well, in what sense then does identities need to be singular or plural, as Sarah used the term? If we're talking about um, the rural, uh, rural spaces, rural areas, then the idea that identities have got to be multiple, <laughs> plural, seems to be self-evidently, you know, important. You know, it's a political um, sort of act to say that. I'm talking about capacity to care in my book, and it's partly because I think identities, the dominant usage of it in social science is um, social identities. And when we use identities in the plural, we're partly saying social identities, whether it's out there in, at the societal level, like in rural spaces, many groups, or whether it's in this, in, the, in the case of an individual where we are multiple and fragmented and so on in the way that Anne was referring to when she introduced this. Um, but even at the level of the multiplicity of individuals, I still want to concentrate on identity in the singular because I think um, what we have is that there is a kind of need and a struggle for integration or coherence in the face of multiplicity and fragmentation. Um, I've, I've uh, addressed this question in the, quest in the questions that I've asked in the book, which is, in a way, how do we become capable of caring? Um, that literature, the care literature, again, is very uh, <coughs> connect associated with the social conditions of care and the resources for care. And it, it doesn't um, often ask the question about the capacity to care. And I found myself having to go back to the uh, early mother or primary carer infant relationship to actually think about how people achieve the capacity to care. And I suppose, um, in a nutshell, um, you'd say um, <clears throat> that if people cannot imagine and identify with as another state's of, another's state of mind, 
then their capacity to care will be compromised by that. And so it's about how that's achieved in the dynamics of identification among people and the relationality, specifically often the unconscious intersubjectivity that flows between people. Um, and so that's where I want to concentrate when I'm looking at the concept of identity, or indeed, as I often prefer to call it, subjectivity, precisely because that concept is just a little bit more removed from the idea of social identities to enable me to retain that psychosocial focus that, that I want to do to answer the question. Um, but I think what I, I, all the way through the book, I was, because of my commitment to going beyond a kind of unitary uh, individual, um, I was very committed to the idea of understanding uh, identity through the idea of unconscious intersubjectivity. So in that sense, um, you know, we are many people inside of every one, and in that sense there's multiplicity. But by the end of the book, I realized that that wasn't going to be enough. And what I came to in the end, um, in trying to theorize this uh, subjectivity, was that subjectivity had to be, needed to be understood in terms of a constant dynamic tension between intersubjectivity on the one hand, often unconscious intersubjective dynamics, and on the other hand, individuality and a striving for individuality. And actually that echoes very much, I didn't realize that this was what she was going to say, what Helen said in relation to siblings and selfhood. Um, and so it came out for me that it was a both and, but that those kind of desires and needs for subjectivity were in constant tension with each other and were differently articulated in different relationships and different settings. Um, but I, I do want to hang on to the idea of identity in the singular in order to be able to ask questions about the, the struggle which we uh, have lifelong for a certain amount of integration in our life. And I think the pat use of identities in the plural when it refers to people, in individual people, can actually lose uh, that issue. Um, well, I'm Jane Ribbons McCarthy, and I've been writing about young people's experiences of loss and bereavement in conjunction with um, other writers as well, notably Julie Jessup and Sue Sharp. Um, the book's based on a wide-ranging literature review, which was funded by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, and also some new in-depth case studies, uh, which were drawn from some um, longitudinal qualitative studies um, based on the lives of young people generally, um, but in these cases talking about a range of bereavement experiences. So the book addresses a topic that's not usually thought of in identity terms, it brings together two disparate sets of issues, on the one hand bereavement and on the other hand young people. Now both these areas may be theorised as psychosocial transitions which have the potential to be disruptive. So their conjunction may be regarded in some senses as constituting a double jeopardy, um, an anxious topic to be looking at. They are thus both of course personal and social experiences that also relate to key features of social structures and inequalities. Such inequalities can be seen, for example, in the way in which mortality rates continue to vary very significantly um, by social class and locality. Um, it can also be seen in terms of the way, if we look at unwelcome outcomes in the lives of parentally young people, we find that those at the risk of such outcomes is significantly raised if they are also experiencing other social disadvantage in their lives. So the book also considers the more quantitative evidence about the implications of a major bereavement for the lives of young people over the shorter and longer term and the ways in which we may bring individual social and structural issues into focus together. Now while the position of young people has been theorised through both sociological and psychological concepts of youth on the one hand and adolescence on the other, bereavement has been largely neglected as a social phenomenon even though it is, if, as soon as you start to think about it, profoundly about social bonds and personal connections. Instead, it's primarily understood as a personal experience and framed through psychological perspectives. But I'm a sociologist, so I hope I've brought some new and critical perspectives to my reading of these literatures.